Good afternoon and a warm welcome to everybody, both our in-person audience and also our online audience. My name is Davide Gasparotto. I'm the Senior Curator of Paintings and Chair of Curatorial Affairs here at the Getty Museum. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that the land Getty inhabits today was once known as Tovangar, the home of the Gabrielino Tongva people. We show our respects to the Gabrielino Tongva people, as well as all first people, past, present, and future, and honor their labor as original ca caretakers of this land. Getty commits to building relationships with the Gabrielino Tongva community. We invite you to acknowledge the history of this land and join us in caring for it. It is my very great pleasure to introduce today's event, Anatomy of Lucas Cranach's Adam and Eve, a case study in conservation. This program has been conceived to complement the beautiful display, Conserving Eden, Cranach's Adam and Eve from the Norton Simon Museum of Art, on view in the North Pavilion of the Getty Museum through April 21st. Painted in the 1530s, these two pictures are not only among the greatest treasures of the Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena, but they are also defining works of German Renaissance painting. They were treated here at Getty starting in 2021 as part of an important and ongoing partnership with the Norton Simon. It is a pleasure to welcome here among our today's audience the president of the Norton Simon, Walter Timoshuk, as well as representatives of the board of the trustees and several staff members from our sister institution. Today, we will hear from curators, conservators, and scientists an in-depth um, discussion about the history and significance of these two pictures, and especially about the complex conservation treatment that was performed here at Getty in the last three years. The panel, today's panel, is divided in two parts. In the first segment, Getty curator Anne Woollett, who is our expert in uh, uh, Northern European paintings, and Norton Simon chief curator Emily Talbot will present the artist and his work and will talk about the partnership of our two museums. While senior conservators John Griswold from the Norton Simon and Ulrich Birkmeier from the Getty will discuss their assessment of the condition of the paintings before treatment and the main decisions they faced. After a 30 minutes break at uh, three, at about three o'clock, when you can enjoy some refreshments in the auditorium lobby, we will present a second chapter of the story, which will include a discussion of the complex and fascinating structural treatment on the two panels, which was conducted by George Bisacca, who is here with us today, conservator emeritus at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and Jose de la Fuente, conservator at the Museo del Prado in Madrid, who unfortunately is not with here Today, he was here a couple of weeks ago when unfortunately the program has to be, had to be postponed because of the rain. And their uh, George presentation will be followed by a presentation of what we have learned about the technique of execution of the two paintings through close observation over a long period of time and a series of sophisticated scientific investigations which were performed by Douglas McLennan, assistant scientist at the Getty Conservation Institute who will discuss the results together with Ulrich Birkmeier. Thank you very much, Davide. Hello and welcome to all of you here in person and with us online. Um, I'm Ann Woollett, and it's my pleasure um, to start us off with a very brief, and I apologize in advance for treating a wonderfully complex artist such as Lucas Cranach, the elder, uh, in the speedy way. Um, but I thought it would be nice to have a prelude um, to our in-depth discussion to hear a little bit about um, 
this magnificent uh, painter, engraver, printer, um, who was active in the first third of the 16th century. We see here uh, on the screen two self-portraits from two parts of Cranach's career. Uh, he was born in the town of Cranach in Germany. This is probably where his family name and his own name comes from. Uh, probably trained, we think, with his father there. Um, the uh, image on your right, there, or I guess on your left, as you're looking at, of young Cranach uh, from the beginning of his career as he becomes a court painter, an affluent and successful man. And then the second image presents Cranach as he would have looked, we think, as he painted the Norton Simon panels. Um, <laughs> still an intense uh, personality, um, but also just a few years down the road. Uh, Cranach was uh, invited to the court at Wittenberg by Elector uh, Duke uh, Friedrich III, um, the wise of, of Saxony, and we see him here in the Roundel portrait by Cranach. Uh, this was a great appointment for him and the beginning of an illustrious career. And in this capacity, uh, which covers the time period that we'll talk about in depth today, um, Cranach produced a myriad of works uh, for the court, um, really helping to spread its culture, its sophistication, its style, um, not only within Wittenberg town itself, but um, to serve as an ambassador, really, for the electors. Um, in this capacity, Cranach, as court painter, had a stipend, uh, he had uh, lodging, um, he received money for clothes in the summer and in the winter, um, he was given a car, uh, horse in that case. Um, so he, he had a full ride there. Um, and uh, he was also able to really maximize um, the support of the electors to be incredibly productive. Um, the works I'll sh show you today um, will take us rapidly through just a small proportion of things. Um, many things don't survive. He created ephemeral things for the the parties <laughs> for um, uh, residences owned by the electors um, that don't exist anymore. Uh, so there's a whole sector of Cranach's life that we don't know about. He did serve, um, though, uh, before his death in 1553, three electors, and here we see um, to the subsequent two following uh, Frederick the Wise, um, John the Steadfast, and uh, Johann Friedrich the Magnanimous, um, the last elector seen here as a young boy, but um, Cranach died at the age of 81, uh, still in his service. Uh, Cranach was famous for many um, types of work that he produced for the electors. Uh, very briefly, to show you one of the most beautiful um, genres that he developed for them, these wonderful hunting scenes. Uh, Cranach was very much appreciated for his ability to render animals, amongst other things, including portraits. And this combines the two in a riveting kind of cinematic view of life at the Wittenberg court, where you have um, members of the court uh, hunting from boats and on land and with crossbows um, and from horseback. Um, to give you another sense, a little bit of some of the other works he produced, um, very early on uh, he made his name um, working initially in Vienna and then coming to the Wittenberg court, but as he emerges, um, it's, he has a very per distinct personal style, it's very energetic, very painterly. Um, the scene of crucifixion you see here really, uh, I think, exhibits the dynamism and the sort of the creativity that he brought to interpreting um, very important uh, religious subjects. Uh, in this era, actually, this is the era of the Reformation, Cranach himself um, was uh, close and friendly to uh, Martin Luther. Uh, we believe, of course, that he himself had Lutheran um, sensibilities, but he had worked for a variety of patrons, so not just for uh, you know, the emerging Protestant patrons, but also for the Catholic patrons. The piece in the middle is the Getty's own um, scene by Lucas Cranach the Elder. It represents uh, another genre in which he was quite innovative um, and from which I think he took some um, stimulus from the man he replaced at the court, Jacopo de Bogari, uh, a very skillful Italian painter and printmaker who had also begun to be interested in the nude and particularly the female figure. The Getty's painting shows um, a sort of an idyllic time. It was a, a topic of, of interest at the Wittenberg court, the kind of golden age of man. Um, in this case, we see um, a wild couple, <laughs> if you will, a fawn perhaps, and his spouse and their children um, on the other side of the hedge, if you will, on the other side of the gro evergreen growth um, from um, the civilized cities. Um, and then you see the slain lion in the foreground. Uh, 
you know, Cronach's knowledge of animals was extensive, but we don't think he actually saw his lions. And so the Getty's drawing here of a lion, <laughs> I think, has so much character and also kind of exhibits this very energetic line that he used. Very important for our discussion today is the development of the theme of Adam and Eve. Um, it wouldn't be complete without looking very briefly at Albrecht Dürer's incredibly influential print uh, from 1504, showing the first couple um, and uh, really importing into the sensibilities of the artists um, who were watching Dürer, who included Kranach, um, you know, this ideal uh, body type, um, referencing classical uh, antiquity um, into a natural landscape. We see a spatial recession here, a central tree um, in which the serpent very, I think very interestingly, has come down to the level of, the, of Adam and Eve and is actually handing Eve uh, the fruit. Uh, there are many things to say about this, um, but uh, one of the interesting things I think in particular is the relationship of the figures, the sort of push and pull between them, um, a balance and an equilibrium just before um, they commit to the first sin. It was a very important work for Cronach's um, paintings of Adam and Eve, um, but I show you one of the first iterations of the subject that he made, which is this print, um, in which he situates them surrounded by this you know, superabundance of the natural world, um, these beautiful animals, most of which have a, a symbolic meaning. Uh, we see our friend the lion you know, stretched out in the front there. Um, and fascinatingly, um, Kronach has moved away, in a, in a sense, from uh, Durer's idea of these very separate figures um, and drawn them, drawn Adam and Eve together. And instead of having a very contained pose that we saw in Durer, she reaches up to um, grasp the branch and to grasp the fruit, um, something that would become an essential part of his interpretation of the theme. Um, we know that he painted at least 50 versions of the Adam and Eve theme. This is probably a very small percentage. Uh, part of Kranach's work for the court um, involved making um, large quantities of art that were desired, uh, multiple versions of, of um, portraits of the electors to share. Um, and he had interpreted the Adam and Eve theme, I think, quite um, intriguingly, if one um, kind of takes time to go through this catalog of the, of the surviving works, they're really subtle and different and interesting uh, adjustments to the narrative. I show you here a relatively early work um, from Warsaw uh, in which the um, Adam and Eve appear together on a single panel with a tree in the center. Um, this is uh, some, uh, an idea he comes back to subsequently um, while he's doing the mythological works. Inventory suggests that the mythological uh, works and in, um, in collections were owned together and may have been displayed together uh, with um, works from the Bible. Uh, this is an important painting um, in connection with the Norton Simons panels uh, here in London from the Courtauld Institute, uh, where we see the Adam and Eve together again, single panel, surrounded in this natural environment. You know, a relatively flat conception of space um, here, but very abundant, a very abundant apple tree. And um, we see this quizzical gesture in which Adam is really beginning to think about <laughs> with this decision before him. Um, yeah. And <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm glad you're laughing because I, I do find that I think, um, although these works, I think, have many layers of meaning and, and the viewers invited, I think, to think about their own kind of... Um, their own humanity and their own questions before them in their lives, the choices they make. Um, there is a real sense of humanity that Cronach uh, brings, and they are meant to be, I think, rather delightful. And I think we're supposed to admire these bodies in a way they're presented in a way for us to really see and to scrutinize. Um, one of the most important aspects, as far as my experience of the Norton Simon paintings during the project, has been the experience of the life-size scale that um, Cronach takes this story to. Um, he did treat the uh, subject in separate panels, as we know from the Norton Simon and um, other um, iterations, uh, also with these subtle differences, with different modes of connection between the sitters. In this case, you see Eve's, you know, radiant locks, which have some kind of supernatural power, <laughs> kind of <laughs> reaching out there towards Adam that draw the two um, figures together. Uh, this is another work that I would, uh, I think, follows uh, the Norton Simon works, in which uh, Cronach returns to the uh, verdant uh, natural environment of the figures. Um, but, you know, the, uh, 
Norton Simon panels I find extraordinary uh, for so many reasons, but uh, as a result of the treatments, you really have a sense of physical presence. Um, we see him, them here against a neutral background as if you know, they're in a paused moment of time. Um, it's an uh, extraordinarily effective foil, this um, inky black background, and the very uh, subtle but important ways in which the figures relate to one another with their gestures. Uh, and I have to say, Emily, you know, I've known your paintings for a long time in your museum, and um, it's the ability to actually <laughs> communicate one-on-one -on -one, um, with these works that I think really sets them apart. Mm -hmm. um, but I know they've been special <laughs> to you for a while, too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne. I'm going to move the slides forward to talk a little bit about the context of the chronic paintings at the Norton Simon Museum. I'm assuming most of our local audience has visited the Norton Simon in Pasadena, perhaps not the case for those who are tuning in online. So I'm going to give a little overview of the institution and our collection. We display a collection that was put together by the industrialist Norton Simon between the mid-1950s and the late 1980s. And we have strengths in 19th century French painting, and here I'm showing you my beloved Impressionist gallery. Uh, 14th through 18th century European art, and here you're seeing a corner of our Italian Renaissance gallery and a wall from our 17th century Dutch gallery. And also a really splendid collection of South and Southeast Asian sculpture that spans over 2,000 years. And here you're looking at our wonderful gallery dedicated to Chola period bronzes. The Chronic paintings are two of the most important works in our small but really fine collection of 15th and 16th century German and Netherlandish painting. And I just selected a few of my favorites here to help contextualize the Chronics and some of the reasons that Norton Simon might have been interested in them. On the lower left, you're looking at Hans Memling's Christ Giving His Blessing from 1478. This was one of the first works from this area to enter the collection. and. Norton Simon displayed it in his study for what I imagine was frequent contemplation and admiration. On the upper left, Derek Bouts' Resurrection from circa 1455, another beautifully finely painted panel um, painting on linen, and one of the latest works to come into the collection. This one entered in 1980, and this work has the distinction of being the most expensive work of art that Norton Simon ever bought. And then in the center, two really beautiful nudes. I wanted to really give a sense of how much Simon was responding to this expressive potential of the body and the humanity of the figures, as you were saying, Anne. Um, and I think the two chronic paintings really exemplify a lot of the qualities that he was interested in across his collection. But because they're really over life size, because they've been brought really to the foreground of the composition, there is this kind of confrontation, this moment of acknowledging us, of implicating us in the narrative that I think is really powerful. Simon was first offered the paintings in the late 1960s, and I admit when I went through the files, I learned that he hedged on the purchase. Um, this was not unusual for him. But he had some doubts about the condition, the very issues that we'll be discussing today, and he wondered if he should hold out for one of the smaller format paintings for which Chronic is so well known. But when they came out to California for consideration, I think he was really won over by their presence in person, by their wall power, if you will. And I love this photograph because you can really get a sense of his kind of astonishment at their beauty when they were installed at LACMA shortly after the acquisition in 1970. This was the moment that Simon was starting to reconceive of his private collection as a public museum. And even before we moved into the building that we're currently in, in 1974 and 1975, the highlights from the collection were traveling around the country. And so here you're seeing some of those installed at an exhibition at the Princeton University Art Museum in 1972. And I like this photograph because it gives you a sense that even from quite a distance, the chronic paintings are reading so well from across the room. So they have a quality that I think speaks particularly well to their context in a museum where they have a public and where people can really admire them um, from near and far. And here, this is a, an installation shot from the late 1990s after the interior of our museum was renovated by Frank Gehry. And again, they've had pride of place in the museum since 1976 when they were first installed there. We've had them on continuous view. And they've, I think, become some of the very favorite works of art in our collection. To give a little bit of context for our relationship with Getty Paintings Conservation, 
Our relationship dates back decades, but started in a more formal way in 1994, when Getty Paintings conservators very generously began coming out and conducting surveys of our painting collection on a regular basis. The purpose of this was to make condition issues known to us, to advise on treatment, and at times to assist us with packing particularly delicate works of art for loan or conducting minor treatments on site. You can see Ulrich very generously doing just that in the image on the lower right. And beginning in 2008, we began sending one important work over to the Getty every few years for a more in-depth treatment. We've now conducted, I think, over 10, 10 or 11 treatments, and I wanted to show you just a small selection of the most successful ones to give you a sense of, of the range and the kinds of projects that we've done with the Getty. This was the very first work that was treated here, uh, Francisco de Zerberon's Still Life with Lemons, Oranges, and a Rose from 1633, one of our most special paintings at the Norton Simon Museum. And just from the before and after shots, you can probably see how successful this treatment was, removing the discolored varnish and what we learned were glazes that had been applied to the um, lemons and the oranges to give them more of a California citrus look, um, <laughs> which was happily removed um, by the conservators here and really returning the painting to its original 17th century Spanish splendor also revealing the actual appearance of the table. I hope you can see in this slide that um, these beautiful little diamond inlays on the corners of the table were revealed as the retouching was removed. So it was a really exciting first treatment. I'll fast forward a few years to one of our opportunities to work with George Bazaka on our beautiful Rembrandt self-portrait. Um, here's George at work, uh, removing the wooden additions that had been placed around the edges of this painting. And we've also done treatments that resulted in an exhibition like the one associated with the Chronix. And so this was an exhibition that took place in 2015, 2016. Um, Giovanni Di Paolo's Branchini Madonna came to the Getty for conservation treatment and technical analysis. And I think those findings helped to inform, I won't speak for Davide, but um, informed in some way the beautiful exhibition Shimmer of Gold that he did that reunited the Branchini Madonna with other panels from the same altarpiece. So we've been extremely fortunate to work with the Getty team on a number of projects, and I will now turn it over to my colleague John Griswold to tell us a little bit about the condition of the chronic paintings before treatment. Uh, thanks, Emily, um, and and Davide for the chance to be here and share this. Um, the as as Emily said, the Adam and Eve really held a very strong. Uh, presence in the galleries. Um, they also stood out uh, for their surface, for something you might in a kindly way refer to as sort of an old world glow, um, uh, thanks largely to this very thick, uh, discolored, yellowish varnish. Um, uh, in spite of that, you really did have a sense of just the uh, incredibly skillful way that these were painted, um, uh, just the magnificence of, of Chronox paint handling. Um, so in spite of um, some of the, the surface issues that were amplified by this very glossy obscuring surface, um, some of which indicated uh, a deeper um, uh, uh, structural issue, um, they really still had quite a presence. So here you can see what I mean on the left, um, how this glossy surface at certain angles in the galleries would really um, amplify some anomalies, to say the least, on the surface, um, not the least of which is this odd uh, polygonal sort of five-sided uh, shape that extends from Adam's forehead up into the overhanging branch of the tree above at an odd angle. Um, in addition to that, there are a lot of vertical splits that you can see between what essentially are the individual <clears throat> planks that make up each panel. Uh, each of those planks also has a, a convex uh, curvature um, and essentially this sort of what we would call a washboard effect is something that was really quite um, prominent on both panels. But uh, Adam especially was um, uh, the subject of a lot of head scratching. 
No pun intended. Illusion intended in that <laughs> particular case. <laughs> um, in our files, we also had this really wonderful set of uh, vintage, if you will, if you call 1970 uh, X radiographs vintage. Um, that's what these are. We had enough F X radiographs to put them together sort of as a mosaic, and we had an entire X ray, essentially, of both figures. On the left, you can see this oddly shaped uh, insert. Um, and on the right, um, this is the bottom of Eve's panel where between the woodworm and possible additional rot or water damage along the bottom, a lot of the material was lost of the, the wood substrate itself. Um, some of these white uh, areas are uh, the highly dense uh, patching repair material from previous interventions. But the most prominent thing that you can see in these two images is this horizontal and vertical uh, crossing of wood members, which barely makes the rest of the information in these images visible at all. Those are the components of a heavy wooden cradle that was put onto the back of these panels after the panels were reduced by more than half of their original thickness. This was a, a routine, um, uh, sometimes preventative, sometimes um, uh, corrective, uh, attempt to flatten panels that had warped uh, or prevent their uh, future warping proactively. Um, very aggressive, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that uh, later, especially in the, the second half of this um, uh, panel discussion when, when George Bazaka gives us some insight into the amazing work that followed. Looking closely at the surface in the galleries, you really did have a sense of um, being able to see areas that were pretty confidently Carnock's original surface. On the left side, um, I have this high-powered, hope I'm pointing it the right way. Through, all throughout here, you have a sense that this very crisp, sort of fresh-looking cracked surface, this crack allure, this network cracking, that's indicative of, of Cronach's original paint surface. As you start encroaching into this area along the bridge of the nose, this is one of those vertical splits that's been filled. Uh, things are looking a little dicey around the, uh, the eyebrows. Um, and certainly here, where you can see the edge of that insert, this is all completely repainted. And uh, to carry the illusion across that don't look here, there's nothing wrong. Uh, the restorer actually seems to have stroked in, Ulrich can correct me later if I'm not correct about this, but I recall that a lot of these little uh, marks were brushed on simulations of the, um, mm -hmm. of the crack pattern. Mm -hmm. Another example showing just how incredibly distracting the, the glossy surface was, and in spite of that, um, this is the upper left portion of the Eve panel, um, and it's just magnificent when you would stand there and look at how Cronach had built up this beautiful surface of the snake with um, incredible subtle blending of tone and color and then uh, finishing off with these wonderful calligraphic dark strokes defining the scales. Uh, a really wonderful uh, sort of accident of history is that as the, um, the flesh tones gradually became more transparent, we had the ability to see glimpses of Cronach's original beautifully brushed uh, underdrawing uh, uh, that he uh, uh, finished completely on the ground of the, the panels. Um, here's a detail of the fig leaf, and I think you can see right here this beautifully stroked line. Uh, that's an example of what we would call a pentiment. Um, uh, an artist's changing of mind, if you will, and the uh, the final painted outline of the, the leaf um, didn't follow the original concept. So there are lots of um, wonderful little indications of that and what was lying underneath. Um, in raking light, light that's sort of glancing sideways along a surface, you can get surface conditions magnified. Here on the left, on Adam's knee, you can see sort of a sunken in area of uh, patching and repair, uh, overpainting, um, that uh, you'll, you'll find out later uh, what's actually under there. Um, and on the right here, this largely original area of, of paint um, is doing what we call tenting. 
often it's a, a situation where the wooden substrate on which the brittle oil paint uh, lies changes dimensions. Often it can shrink when it loses its inherent moisture, and there's no more place, no more surface area for the, the paint to, to lay down flat. So it actually pitches up, it tenses, tents up, and that doesn't bode well for long-term preservation. This detail of Adam's shoulder, the, the crack pattern here, um, these interesting sort of light edges along the kind of slightly up-curved, uh, uh, cupped, if you will, edges of the, of the paint surface. Um, partially, those are lighter because of the loss of some of the dark varnish, and that gives a tantalizing uh, glimpse into the full uh, tonal and color range of what lies beneath. So we had a sense before this project even started that there was so much to reveal. Maybe the most uh, interesting and persistent question we had um, was whether or not Cronach originally conceived of this to be a single panel. Um, had the panel been made all in, at once at one time and the, the composition painted together, or were they separate? Um, there are several examples throughout our, our um, archives that have photographs showing different occasions when they were butted up right next to each other. And I have to admit that the tree looks very much complete. The ground looks kind of continuous. Maybe even a stray blade of grass might suggest how it goes from one panel to the next, that maybe that was the case, that it was joined. Um, but that was just sort of an ongoing mystery that we were looking forward to having solved. Um, Going back to our relationship uh, between our institutions, um, we owe so much to the Getty for that relationship. Uh, the uh, museum's uh, painting conservation department since 1994 has been doing uh, condition surveys of all of our paintings. Um, the conditions, uh, uh, the, the needs, if you will, of the panels has always been taken into consideration in the overall context of all of our collections, having these surveys, uh, prioritizing, uh, treatments according to a range of criteria um, has really been useful in our overall management of the conservation of our collections. Uh, by 2021, um, uh, a comprehensive program emerged that would both address the surface and the structural issues, and at the same time give an opportunity to learn about the methods and the materials that the artist used. And this came forward in the form of a, a proposal from Ulrich who uh, suggested a multi-step program uh, and very much a team approach. The first step would be that Ulrich would remove the, the obscuring varnish, all the overpaint, to for the first time reveal the true condition of Cronach surfaces. Um, that would then allow uh, George Pisaca and uh, Jose de la Fuente of the Prado to come in and do the incredibly critical uh, and challenging work of reestablishing some uh, structural unity to the, the panels. Um, uh, at the same time, the GCI scientists would be providing uh, technical imaging, uh, uh, analytical uh, investigations into the, the materials present. And so uh, altogether, this really occurred to us as being just such a dream team, and I, I'm confident that uh, um, you'll, you'll see what I mean as this uh, panel progresses. So our preparators finally had the chance to take these off the wall, unframe them, remove the protective glazing, which gave Ulrich a chance to come over and we examined together under ultraviolet light, uh, really close examination comparing with our uh, vintage x-rays, um, and really building a sense of um, confidence of what lay ahead. This was our first glimpse in a very long time of the offending cradles. Um, it was also the, my first chance to really see the back of these panels. And, and I want to say now, before handing it over to the, the real heroes of this collaboration, um, uh, that what you will be seeing uh, this afternoon may um, be a little bit shocking when you uh, consider just how precious and amazingly rare and unique these panels are. But remember that these panels have already been thinned, that you're not looking at an original surface at all on the back, that what's, what's been done to these panels in, in shaving them down to attach this heavy piece of uh, furniture, if you will, um, 
really sort of set the tone for all the work to follow. Uh, I'll hand this back to you. Yep. And I'll hand it down to Ulrich <laughs> to tell us a little bit about his first impressions of the panels when they came to the Getty. Yeah, yeah thank you, um, John and, um, and Emily, for the introduction to this, um, to this project, which was really um, a thrill of a lifetime. And, um, and I, can, I can just um, repeat that again. It was really a dream team. So thank you so much for entrusting us with these works. Um, um, it was just an amazing project um, that came all together um, within the past two and a half years. Um, and I distinctly remember our first conversations in storage um, at the Norton Simon. When we looked at the paintings and when you look at this, fo at this photograph behind me, um, you would think that the condition or the state of preservation of these panels is actually not so bad. But um, that really belies um, their true condition. So once we looked closer um, at the panels, um, the surface and also the reverse, um, it became clear that they were dramatically compromised. Um, once by um, that cradle that John had talked about, um, that had originally been applied to, um, to give a um, to protect the, the surface, to, to provide a structural um, surface to, um, for the paintings. Um, but it had actually caused some of the problems that we're now faced with, um, as the cracks and, and splits that had developed over time, um, in addition to the dramatically discolored varnish or surface coatings that had been applied to the painting surface over the centuries um, and past decades. Um, now we have to realize that these paintings have been treated several times in the past. Um, so they were disfigured not only by um, the problems um, that the cradle had caused, but also by these um, yellowed and um, oxidized varnishes. Um, and also old restorations that had discolored and started to show um, through. So um, it's important to remember, of course, that we're looking at paintings that are 500 years old. And um, they've been through a lot, and they've seen a lot. <laughs> and, and maybe just um, to briefly um, give you a glimpse into the rather dramatic um, chapter of their um, of the history. Um, I'd like to show you um, a short clip um, that um, shows you the the rather um, um, terrible moment um, that lasted for about five years, 1940, when the paintings, together with um, other collections. Um, were looted by the Nazis, um, specifically um, Hermann Goering, um, in this case, um, to be installed in Karin Hall, his um, hunting lodge outside of Berlin. Um, you see some of the key players, um, Rose Ballon um, here, um, who risked her life um, um, documenting all the Nazis' um, art movements and locations. Um, for the Resistance, and um, earlier we saw um, Thomas Carr Howe, um, who was one of the monuments men actually in charge of the recovery of these paintings. And this is a clip um, from 1945, July 1945, um, that shows you the recovery of um, these paintings, but really um, the massive collection um, looted collection that Goering had amassed that ended up in Berchtesgaden um, close to Hitler's eagle's nest and um, many of the artworks were still on the train um, that Goering had um, sent from Karin Hall to um, Berchtesgaden um, for all the works to be hidden in salt mines and bunkers um, here you see the 101st 
airborne division carrying out some of these works from the bunker, um, from one of the Goering bunkers, <laughs> carrying them casually through the woods. And um, in fact, we, um, we think that some of these damages that you see in the paintings, um, specifically on um, to the left of Adam's head, um, might actually stem from the handling um, um, during that moment. Um, paintings, sculptures were stacked um, on, these, on these trucks, and so you can imagine um, that there was quite a bit, quite a bit of damage that um, was caused in the process. Now, some of these, um, some of these damages um, were readily um, visible on the surface. And when we first examined the painting in storage, um, and you can see me here um, taking measurements of the, of the reverse of that cradle that we decided eventually um, needed to come off. Um, and here again is a cradle of the back of Adam. And here you can see in strong side light or raking light um, that washboard effect that John had um, told us about earlier. Um, it becomes particularly evident when you see the painting in the strong side light. And uh, it became clear and became evident that we very much needed to address um, the structural um, issues that were associated with these, um, with these um, washboard effect. Now here are new x-rays of the painting and, um, and it was fascinating actually to have the comparison um, to the old x-rays um, that um, were difficult to read. Um, those were the images that John showed us earlier um, where you had the slats from, um, from the cradle um, really um, hiding the, or not enabling us to read the images properly, um, which was now possible. And so um, you can see in these very, the black spots um, um, shows the areas of loss in the painting. Um, but it also enables us to see um, through the paint layers and how the, how Kranach uh, built the painting up and um, so it was really helpful in um, learning much more about the structural, um, very sophisticated um, process that um, Kranach used in, in, the, um, in painting these works. Um, this is a slide um, during the cleaning of the painting. So on the left, you see the area already freed from that very yellowed varnish. Um, half of the painting. Um, is still covered in, in this um, disfiguring varnish. Um, again, um, Adam's legs um, on the right still covered with um, old discolored varnish. On the left, um, freed from, <laughs> from those layers. And um, this is um, a slide I wanted to show you to, um, to document that it documents um, that there was not just um, complete loss, but a lot of abrasion um, in the paint surface. So um, it was really a, a very complex um, problem that we were facing in the in the conservation treatment and in the in the following um, in painting or um, retouching process. Um, you can see some of the old inserts, um, old restorations. Um, um, close to um, the toes of um, Adam's leg. And you actually see some of the um, toes missing, um, the tip of the toes. Again, Eve um, doing the cleaning. And um, here's an old restoration um, that in my um, removal of the old restorations actually came off. And here is a picture from a file um, 
from the Norton Simon um, that shows an even older iteration of, an, of a restoration. Um, again, not very um, successfully um, reconstructed foot. This is just a short clip that shows you um, the paintings when, we're, when we had them in the studio here at the Getty. Um, it was actually a very um, long process because um, it was during COVID, so um, we're not um, able to, to work every day. So um, the cleaning took about, um, I'm gonna say three months or so. And it shows you some of these steps involved in the varnish removal. Now, these are the paintings after varnish removal and removal of all the old restorations. So you can see just the dramatic extent of loss, of paint loss that we're facing. Here's a detail of Eve, and you can see um, the loss in the branch, um, with her, where her hands, hand rests on the branch, and you see um, the tips of her fingers are missing. Um, but the most um, dramatic, um, here another detail, beautiful detail of the reflection in, in the pupils, both Adam and Eve's eyes, and um, the old restoration and insert um, by Eve's feet. Um, and again, um, most of her toes are missing, actually, um, that needed to be reconstructed. Um, here's George, um, ready to uh, address the structural work. Um, but I wanted to talk briefly about this very, very um, difficult area that posed some ethical um, um, dilemmas that we're facing in the reconstruction of Adam's forehead. So you can see this old um, insert, which, as we heard from John, was not original. Um, it had actually caused some splits in the painting, so we knew it needed to come out. But, of course, we had to reconstruct um, this area, which... Um, would have been very difficult um, because as conservators, we don't want to make anything up. So, um, and we cannot, I'm not Krana, so um, <laughs> you have to be respectful of um, what you're working with. Um, luckily, um, we had um, the paintings at the Uffizi, and here you see um, George and myself um, examining the, the works at the Uffizi, and it became clear that they're very, very close to um, the Norton Simon um, paintings. In fact, when you compare um, Adam's head um, here on the left um, from the Norton Simon with the um, Uffizi Adam, it becomes clear that they might have been painted actually using the same um, underdrawing or um, cartoon. So um, it gave me very important clues um, in the reconstruction. So I was able to use um, the Uffizi version as a model um, for the reconstruction of the locks that are falling into Adam's forehead. The x-ray was also very informative and helped us to understand much better um, what, the, um, what the materials and processes of, of Kranach, um, um, how they were involved in constructing the painting, and um, in turn it helped me um, in the reconstruction of some of the um, crucial areas. And here you see um, um, the early process of uh, reconstruction. I'm just I'm just um, putting in first layers um, um, during the retouching or in painting process. And um, I think this slide very much illustrates um, why it took us 
two and a half years to <laughs> complete this treatment um, as we're working with, with tiny brushes and um, working on, on you know, one crack at a time, and, or in this case also not just one crack, um, but thousands of them and, um, and very large um, paint losses um, as well. So um, um, it was just um, um, an incredible process um, that really um, took all of our um, work, um, George, Jose, um, um, Douglas, and, and myself, and um, to get it to this point where you see them now. Great. Oh, thank you, Lord. Um, we have time for a few questions. Um, and actually, I might just uh, take us back to that last view, which gives us a chance to see some things. Um, we'll take a few questions, perhaps first from online. And um, if we have time, we can identify uh, some questions here in the auditorium. Um, when that happens, there um, is a, an associate with a microphone that will come to you so that we can all hear your questions and everyone online can hear them. Um, so uh, we have some great questions coming um, from, on, from online. Um, uh, someone asks if we could discuss the fig leaf issue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, they say, I did not expect to find their use in such early paintings. Um, think of it more as a Victorian sensibility. Uh, was it because they would be displayed in churches? Um, maybe I'll... I feel like that, <laughs> I don't that's know why the fig leaf. That's an air question. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> It's a really interesting question because uh, I think that um, the expectation was um, these paintings could be seen in secular env environments. Uh, so, um, yes, the Chronic's approach to the modesty issue, actually, which is appropriate at this moment in the in the sort of biblical narrative, the sin hasn't uh, happened yet, and so they're shown in their natural state, but Adam and Eve are in their sort of natural state. But the viewers, of course, um, are in these... Um, other circumstances. We we don't know for sure actually how all of these paintings functioned, I should say. Um, I think that the scale suggests some of them, like these, were in a very spacious environment. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, I don't know, the elector's residences. Um, but um, it's also the case that uh, there's some evidence that at least one pair um, was um, the outside uh, images of the wings of altarpieces that would have been seen when a triptych was closed. Uh, so this idea of um, uh, you know the uh, redemption of man and, and sort of thing, which would be addressed in the interior panels, as alluded to with the Old Testament story on the exterior. Um, so I think that actually, given the variety of way that if Cronach painted the subject, um, they actually had a variety of uses, which is pretty fascinating. Um, but yes, the, the <laughs> you can't miss the, the foliage here, which I think is really a, one of the fun things and actually one of the best preserved aspects um, mm. of the pigments, right? Um, Very much so, yeah. Um, uh, maybe one more question from online. Um, when Cronach painted, did he assume that layers of varnish would be... Um, would be people on his works, um, or was that process of Renaissance um, people, or did that happen later? Well, the varnishes that um, we were dealing with um, were certainly applied later, but um, we know from um, from contemporary documents um, that Cranach used varnishes. Um, so the varnishes then um, would typically consist of a mixture of resin and and oils. Um, we know of several kinds of, of varnish that Cranach and his studio used. Um, in fact, he um, talks about um, the use of good varnish and common varnish. So um, we do know that um, he would have been very much aware of um, the function and, and maybe some of the pitfalls of, of, of varnish um, as they discolor later. But, um, I think at the time of painting, um, you wouldn't have thought about that, but um, um, someone else, you know, 50 years or 100 years down the road um, is, is faced with, a, yeah. with the dilemma of what to do with these varnishes. Right. Um, the, the idea that, that they were or organic materials that would alter over time mm -hmm. and discolor, turn brownish, uh, was a common, common factor. And of course, they had an important function, didn't they? Varnishes, 
a yeah, protective yeah. function. Also saturating the color, not, not only protecting the surface, but saturating. Yeah, yeah. Great, I think we can take some questions from here in the auditorium. It's a little bit hard for us to see, so. <laughs> Do you want to choose someone? Yeah, maybe right in front, we've had a hand up. <laughs> I think a microphone is coming to you now. Two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the race. Hi, I'm uh, curious about how you isolate the original content from the infilling and retouchment. Very good question. In fact, uh, uh, that is something I should have mentioned. Um, that is um, sort of a paramount um, um, point that we, um, it's, it's part of our ethical um, approach in modern conservation, that we use materials that are clearly um, separated from um, the original paint. So we do use varnishes, um, um, albeit um, modern varnishes, on, on top of the original paint that isolate our um, later work, the, the retouching or um, in-painting, um, if you will. And the colors and materials that we use are very stable, but at the same time, they're 100% reversible. So it might be necessary to remove our work um, in the future again, because it might be necessary to, um, to take it off um, as the materials um, continue to deteriorate, uh, because even the materials we use today eventually will deteriorate, hopefully not before 50 or 100 years or so. But um, it's going to be able, um, the conservers in the future are going to be able to remove um, these materials and these restorations from us um, that, um, without harming the, the original paint surface. I think we can do yeah. one more. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question about the x-rays. Um, the x-rays that you displayed show white areas and black areas. What is the difference between the white and the black? And what additional information can you glean from these particular x-rays? Yeah. Maybe, um, Douglas, if you, if you want to um, elucidate some of these um, yeah. um, <laughs> points. And, it, and, it, and in fact, um, we're going to hear much more um, about X-rays and and their use and how we um, interpreted them in in the afternoon session, but um, but maybe um, briefly. So yes, I will. Thank you. Um, in both cases, both in the 70s X-ray and in the the 2022 current X-rays, it's the same principle. Just as you get an X-ray at the doctor, um, the more dense the material is, the less penetrating the X-ray is. So in the case of these films the bright areas are the most dense. So they typically contain things like lead or mercury for paintings. Whereas when you see something that's black, it's technically kind of an overexposed film. So you're getting um, full penetration of the x-rays through the film or through the, the digital plate, whatever the technology is. So the black areas are actually um, um, complete paint losses. Great. I yeah. think actually that's a lovely place for us to stop because it uh, will whet our appetite <laughs> for what will come next. Um, we are going to um, have a brief uh, break. Um, I wanted to take an opportunity just as we are closing here to um, to note that these projects involve a huge number of dedicated and specialized colleagues, um, many of whom, but not all, are, are represented on this slide. We want to thank everyone involved in this project over the many years, um, and to our fantastic and very versatile, flexible team um, of um, AV assistants and um, the Getty Public Programs team who've helped us um, put this panel together. Um, so uh, we look forward to seeing you um, in a few minutes at 3.30. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome back to everyone who's joining us in person to part two of our program, Anatomy of Lucas Cronach's Adam and Eve, a case study in conservation. 
In the first part of this program, we learned about the condition of Adam and Eve before treatment and the surface work that Ulrich conducted. And now we're going to turn to the structural treatment and technical analysis. So I will turn it over to George to give us his in-depth assessment. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I really would like to just state that uh, to thank you to Walter Tomaszek and Emily uh, Talbot and John Griswold for their unflinching support during this really long process, much longer than we had expected. And uh, also to... Uh, also to Ulrich and his staff that welcomed us so, so warmly, and, and of course to Anne for setting up so much of this uh, event. Uh, I, I'm particularly disappointed that my, my great colleague and, and very good friend, Jose de la Fuente, who did the entire treatment with me, was uh, unable to stay this long uh, after we got postponed from the from the original uh, date of the fourth, so he had to go back to the, uh, to Madrid. But uh, uh, so I'll have to present it myself. Uh, but Jose was really a, a, a more than an equal partner in this entire process. So uh, as we've uh, seen this morning, uh, the pictures when they arrived to uh, us. We're, we're in this uh, state, and, and it did occur to me that many of you may not have been familiar with the reverse side of uh, Renaissance paintings on panel, and um, <coughs> so that a structure like this is relatively common to see. However, they are never original to the, to the, uh, to the works, and uh, this was a system developed mostly in the early part of the 19th century uh, in order to deal with uh, the problem of wood movement. So wood, as you know, is a, a hygroscopic material so that um, it's not dimensionally stable. It, it expands when it absorbs moisture and, and it contracts when it loses moisture. And so, um, so they developed a, a, a system to try and deal with that. They, um, you know, the prevailing aesthetic at the time dictated that panels uh, needed to be flat. And so um, the, pr the problem was that uh, the front side of the picture was protected by the varnish and the paint film and the ground, uh, but the reverse side was not. So it really lost moisture only from the reverse, which produced a, a sort of convex warp over time. And this was intolerable to them. And so they developed this system where, as we heard this morning, they would plane down the reverse to less than half of the original thickness. Uh, and uh, then they would moisten it to make it more flexible and press it flat uh, and then uh, at attach onto the reverse uh, a structure uh, as, as we see here on the left. And uh, interestingly, they, uh, they only glued the elements that follow the grain direction, in this case, the vertical elements. They glued those on, but, it, but instead the cross members uh, were fit into uh, pre-cut slots into the, uh, into the vertical members so that the, the, the cross members were free sliding. The, and the idea was that the picture could expand and contract laterally um, but it would still be held uh, in plane. And um, that sounded like a very good idea. However, um, as uh, the newly planed surface was much more uh, reactive to humidity changes, and so uh, in attempting to warp, uh, the, the tension built up in the intersection between the vertical and the horizontal members until the tension was so strong in there that the cross members blocked. And then the accumulation of stresses uh, increased until uh, finally it would uh, cause the splits that, that we now see uh, throughout both of the panels. Now, we, we also, um, because of various other uh, observations on the reverse, we saw that uh, this is probably the second cradle that was applied to, the, to both panels because the, the first cradle produced the splits, and then uh, it was removed so that they could access the, 
the, the cracks to be able to glue them together, and then a second cradle was, was added. Um, and interestingly enough, the, um, when they glued those new cracks together, the surface level was not accurate. And so if there's a step on the surface, they resolved that. It seems incredible, but they scraped the front surface, the, the, the paint surface, uh, to, in order to level across the, sur the surface. And you can see quite readily that the, the, the paint surface on, 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 the, on the figures uh, is still quite beautifully preserved, and that uh, almost, almost all of the, um, the, the, the losses and the damage are relegated to these secondary areas, these, uh, the, the black areas, which, if you think about it, would be much more easily retouched than trying to, uh, trying to deal with retouching on the figures. And uh, so you can really see, for example, in the, in, the, uh, in the atom, you can see that there's been a real attempt to avoid, uh, to avoid the figure here, or that the scraping stops over here just before the arm and then continues below it, and the, the same with the, the eave. Uh, so at least they tried to respect as much as possible the, the, um, the original uh, figures. So uh, those various splits that go across the surface while it's held flat produce this washboard effect. And what we're trying to do is, uh, uh, is to put them back in a kind of alignment for to have one general curvature, uh, except the, uh, the, the accumulated curvature that, uh, that uh, has resulted, and make one curvature more uniform so that uh, the pictures can be lighted more uh, easily and, and, and viewed without uh, sort of disturbance. So, so our first step in the process is to put the picture face down on a, on a padded surface, but it has to be a very thin padded surface because you, you don't want any uh, compression from, from the reverse to, uh, to, to affect the, uh, the, the, the crack, the open cracks. So the first thing we do is to make saw cuts on either side of the uh, cross members, lift out the blocks, and then lift the cross members out. And, uh, and during the process, we had to also very carefully maintain any kind of markings that were on the cradle for their historical record. So those are all um, uh, kept, the, the Norton Simon well, ha has those now. Uh, that they can put in, in their storage. And uh, as the process continued, you see we're going uh, systematically through the panel, but uh, you can also see that we've left at the two extremities and in the middle, we've, we, we've left cross members intact so that it holds everything in position while we're uh, demolishing the, the, the rest of, uh, of the panel. Uh, and each night we would have to put these sandbags uh, on the surface so that uh, it prevents it from warping up in the meantime before we finish, uh, before we finish removing the, the, the cradles. And this is really important because once the, once the panel r r regains a, a much stronger warp, um, you, you really cannot uh, get that back. So, so it was very imperative to, to protect that surface. Uh, so uh, after removal of the cradles, we scraped the reverse to get rid of any wax residue and, and um, glue residue from attaching the cradles, et cetera. And uh, you can see that some of these repairs, the one at the bottom there, that's the lightest part, uh, is a repair that um, they, they cut out that whole section of the bottom of the panel because of the extensive woodworm infestation that you see there on the right. And um, so they, they just cut that right out. But additionally, there are these other inserts, the one just above there. And those are original to the, to the construction. And usually those are um, because they've taken out knots or other defects in the panel itself and they've repaired them all the way through the panels right to the surface. 
uh, before the painter ever extends the ground and the, and the paint film on it. So there are several of those throughout the, uh, both panels, original ones. And in fact, you can see on the lower part below there, the, 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 the grain down there, you can see that it's leading towards a knot that has been taken out. So these other details that we, uh, that we observe, these are uh, half cavities from the, the dowels, uh, which occur on the, on the right side of the atom and on the left side of the eave. Uh, and, and, and they were certainly, uh, are the evidence that the two panels were, at least for a certain portion of its history, were joined together permanently as one panel. And uh, from the distribution of those dowels uh, across the, the, the inner surfaces, uh, we deduced a, a number of things. Certainly, uh, there, there are six of these cavities now, but there certainly were seven. The bottom one has been lost because they cut off the whole bottom of the panel. And in fact, the uppermost one is too close to the edge, also indicating that the pictures were were cut at the top and the bottom, and on the left side of Adam and on the right side of Eve, uh, they've been trimmed all, all, all on those sides. The only sides that have not been trimmed are that center join. And um, so we, we deduced that they were certainly made as two separate objects and then successively joined. And we can understand that because if they were joined uh, from the outset, the treatment of each of the glued joints within the panel would be treated uh, uniformly. But the dowels only appear on that, on that one, uh, one joint in the middle. So uh, it's clear that they were uh, added at a later moment. Also, along that joint, there is a second ground right at the edge uh, of the panel because when they did join them, they didn't quite uh, line up the surface level accurately, and so they had to add another gesso, another, another layer of that to, 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 um, uh, to level the surface uh, to paint on it. And that was done quite early on, so uh, those are just some observations that we could make. Oh, and this is uh, infrared uh, photographs which show how cleanly the, the, uh, the, the, the tree is put together when, when the panels are are joined. So once all of that was removed, the, these panels are in incredibly fragile state. They're only about uh, seven millimeters thick. And uh, because they've been thinned probably twice, like uh, I mentioned, the, the, the two cradles. So all of these open splits on both panels Made it, that, uh, made it so that it was very difficult to move it around, to turn it over to the front side um, to begin work on it. Uh, so here we are. The, the, first, um, the first operation was for us to go and clear out any uh, fillings uh, that, we, we, that were, were still found at the joints because, um, as you can see here, um, um, we're removing that white gesso filling there, and you can see that underneath it is original paint. And so by, by removing that gesso, there'll, there'll be a level difference that then we can finally open up and bring into alignment. You're talking about moving it just by a few millimeters uh, here and there just to get it up to surface level. And we do this by uh, using a high-speed router and uh, we had we had very um, very precise carbide uh, bits for the for these routers that are uh, V-shaped, and uh, they w we cut into the surface to within a millimeter of the paint surface uh, very accurately, and and then uh, fill those cavities, and that gives us the opportunity to to move the surface. To, to, to level it and also to adjust the, the overall curvature. And uh, so because the panel has been uh, uh, planed by hand, it's not a uniform thickness. So while it might be seven millimeters there, 
it might be five millimeters a little bit farther in, so you have to be very careful in your depth setting because otherwise you'll go right through the panel uh, uh, a little farther in. So we use this uh, device that's called the Hecklinger thickness gauge, uh, and, it, and it's accurate in measuring uh, the thickness to a tenth of a millimeter. And, and so that was an essential tool in setting up this whole process. Here you can see uh, a track that has already been cut and the pieces that we make in advance of the same kind of wood uh, that's also been uh, air dried and aged for a number of years. And we use those to, to fit into those uh, tracks that we cut. And then after they're glued, we trim the surface uh, down to, to level. So here you can see one on the end grain that is about a millimeter from the fr from the paint surface. <laughs> <laughs> so it's close. <laughs> uh, don't try this at home. <laughs> uh, so, it's, so a, it's a scary process to, <laughs> to witness for sure. <laughs> so uh, here, here you can see uh, one very narrow track that's being cut, and here's a, a couple of other ones. We have the, these bits at uh, different uh, different apertures because uh, sometimes there's more of a gap, and if you have too narrow of a, of a track, you, uh, you don't you, you don't touch the both surfaces on on both sides, so they have to be done um, individually like that. Here you see it seems like an enormous amount of clamping pressure, but uh, in order to get those surfaces in line, because they they really change from one side to the other. Uh, you know, the surface level changes, and to get it all in alignment so we can glue in the pieces is a, a complicated process to try to, to, to get it all in line. And in fact, even these little wedges that you see at the back of the clamps there, by pushing just one in a little bit farther than the other one, it affects the surface curvature on the other side of the panel. So it's all a lot more precise than it might look in that, <laughs> in that image. <clears throat> so then the pieces uh, are, are then uh, individually fit into the cavities there, one at a time, like this, and, and sometimes like this. And sometimes, sometimes a split will not go straight through the panel, but instead it, it goes obliquely, and those have to be uh, cut by hand sometimes uh, at an angle and are much more difficult to cut. Uh, so this is instead a, a join between two boards, but there's a gap of about three millimeters, and so this could never be an original, um, an original joint because the, 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 the joins were perfectly fit. So for there to be this much of a gap, this is a, a later repair, obviously, and this is horsehide glue. It's incredibly brittle, and um, here we are taking out uh, as much as we could and then spreading the two boards so that we can clean, uh, clean off the glue residue as much as possible uh, in, the, in the joint face. And so here is Jose lifting up one of the boards. You can see his, his proper right forearm is leaning on the panel there, and that's important because... Uh, you can see w w the, the joint we're working on right now is this one. And uh, you can see that in this area, it's unbroken. The paint surface is unbroken. So we have to be very careful that the crack does not extend into the un unbroken area. So he he's holding that uh, down while we lift up uh, another e edge of it. So here's after we're trying to get it all in alignment. And then here's, uh, here are all the pieces set up and individually gluing them in piece by piece. And here's another, another split. And in some cases now, like this split that's in the middle of that picture, uh, at the bottom is that insert that we saw before that was cut out for, for, uh, because of the woodworm damage, and that's obstructing the movement of the crack so we, we can't get it into alignment and we're going to have to cut it first. So this is indicating where we need to 
make the incision, and here we are with the Japanese dotsuki saw cutting, cutting through the addition so that we can then uh, manipulate that crack, clean it out properly, and then, um, and then put it together. And here you can see where that yellow arrow is. The crack is already then put in proper alignment. Now, the, um, the insert that you see at the bottom there, um, it's not a very high quality piece of wood and we knew we were gonna have to substitute them. And an interesting thing is that the that wood um, trying to bond two pieces together, end grain to end grain, they will never be a good bond. It's always a very, very fragile bond. And and so and, and we need to get if, if you can get a glue face onto onto the onto the long grain, it's much, much more stable. So it's quite easy to remove these pieces by just a little bit of pressure like that and the, and the glue cracks and, and you can remove it quite easily. But you can see on the reverse here, we've routed this track that's only a millimeter and a half thick because in this part of the panel, uh, that loss on, uh, to the right there, the panel thins down to just over one millimeter thick and there's all that woodworm infestation there um, that we had to strengthen first before we were gonna make this repair. So that's why we routed that far over so we could bridge into the, uh, into the woodworm uh, area. And you can see that have, having, that, um, having that piece uh, still preserved was because that's what holds up the router while, while you're cutting that surface because any, any movement would, would go through the panel. So, so anyhow, so then we, we can take this apart. And then here you can see uh, where we've, we've actually filled that area with a, with a paste aerodite and uh, consolidated it before, um, before preparing this new piece. Uh, that's made of several individual but much higher quality pieces of wood. That goes in first, and that gives us that, that gluing face uh, so that it's much more, uh, much more stable. So here we are putting a few blocks on and then the clamps to glue that in place so that then when we turn it over, we have a, a stable platform on which to build a second layer. So here's the pieces ready for that second piece to put on, clamping in place. And then afterwards, we cut the excess off and remove those pieces. But it doesn't stop there because then we have to model that surface to match the configuration of the panels. So we had to then further carve each part of that um, to get it in alignment. But the biggest problem, of course, is the is the is the big uh, the big insert in uh, Adam's head, and it's very strange because it goes across onto two two different boards, which is a little bit funny. And the more we examined it from the reverse, we could see that uh, there was a knot in in both of the two boards, so they just put in a single piece uh, going across. However, this particular piece is not original, definitely is not original. And one problem with it is that the grain is diagonally oriented and that contributes to, uh, to the splitting of the, of the panel. This is one of the worst areas and we knew we had to not only remove the, um, the insert and replace it, but we had to take off the entire board on the right side. So, uh, so if you look at it from the reverse, uh, you can see that the 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 join here, which which has has split very early on, but the the joint line continued over there, but it it never broke. It never broke open, and instead instead it broke uh, farther along. So that meant that what we had to do is connect those two lines and cut through that so that it would free up the board so we could remove it. So where we're talking about is, of course, this uh, joint on, on that side of Adam, so you can see where we have to make that diagonal cut. So here we are 
cutting, cutting through the surface. <laughs> I don't know how Walt is feeling about this right now. <laughs> and, uh, and then here where we have routed around the perimeter to give us that extra gluing surface. And here you can see the uh, saw cut that we just made. And here, So I, I was stuck on my side. I, I couldn't get it apart and couldn't figure out why because normally the glue line breaks quite easily, but I couldn't get it apart and we'll see I, why. I got it. <laughs> I got it. There, there, was, there was a nail that bridged across there and, and uh, held that in. In fact, here you can see the nail. And so that nail had to be put in from bef before that insert was made. And that's a modern factory nail, so we know it, it, it was uh, done much later. So, so then, again, uh, quite easy to remove uh, what's remaining there and on the other side. And so uh, there it is, the, ca the, the cavity removed. And so now, now that we had this board completely removed and, 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 and you know, having, having Adam's arm there with the apple, you know, we, we just couldn't help ourselves. <laughs> so, so. And no wonder Adam looks so quizzical. He's, yeah, yeah. he's missing part of his, his head. Yeah. <laughs> So anyhow, having, having this piece removed gave us the opportunity to repair all, all of the defects in, in, in that board before attaching it back on. And uh, so we developed this method of putting a tiny bit of adhesive uh, in at the front surface that, w that would hold the surface level uh, while we turned it over to the other side. And getting that thing in alignment you can see we have any number of, uh, of things here. We have, these are elevator weights, and this is lead shot in, in different containers that uh, you can take out a little bit or add a little bit more, and it changes the surface level. Or if you move the, the things in one direction or another, the slightest movement alters the surface. And so uh, it's very dangerous to have it be face down and, and cut the track and, and you, you can't really see the surface. And so it's better if we, if where we can, to, uh, to glue that surface even minimally so that it holds it in position for us to turn it over. To turn it over. And now we have our, our curvature and our surface level are already taken care of, at least in the three quarters of the split in the middle. And then we route our track, and then we set our pieces in, and then we can deal with the two ends after that. So then, uh, in order to rebuild that loss, we took a tracing of this, the size of the piece we needed, and we, and we built a small section and cut that out by hand, and then testing the surface there. And then, that ha and then here you can see now that the wood grain is lined up so that it's parallel with, with the actual grain of the panel so that it won't exert any additional stress on it. And so then that was set up for clamping. And then it's turned over again and we have that platform ready to, to accept a second piece. And so, so once all of the splits were finished in that way and all of the inserts, I, I didn't uh, go into several of the other inserts that we put on, but, but uh, here we're uh, spreading a layer of uh, B72, Acrylord B72, which is one of the most stable synthetics ever developed. And we're using it as a coating here that it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's semi-permeable to moisture. 
so that it's, it's not 100% impermeable. And what we're trying to do is equilibrate the moisture loss between the reverse and, and, and the front side of the panel uh, so that it, it, it will behave more um, stably. So that's spread first on the surface. And now we need to make a, we need to, it, it's still so fragile now because it's only seven millimeters thick. We have to make a, a, a secondary support strainer to hold it in position to keep it from torquing and to uh, regulate the movements of the panel without being able to, to, for it to bind. So first we put one board on either side of the panel, like this, and those are a little bit thicker than the total amount of curvature of, of the panel. So then we can take these slats, there, there are five of them for each of the cross members, they're four millimeters each, so uh, makes a, a total of 20 millimeters, two centimeters, and, and we can organize them as cross members. Then we, we spread this uh, epoxy adhesive on all the surfaces of those 25 pieces, and then we organize them uh, symmetrically. And it, it may look like an enormous amount of pressure, but in fact, the, the center one of these beams uh, is quite, uh, quite strong. Uh, there you can put a lot of pressure because uh, the, the panel is laying against a, uh, a, a hard surface uh, and so pressing, pressing in the center does not affect the curvature at all. But the beams on the left and right, uh, we are very carefully um, turning the, uh, the clamp screws so that it, it pushes the, the, um, those cross members down only as far as just barely touching the, the, the surface of the panel. And uh, it's not exerting any stress at all on the curvature. And, and that you can tell by... Uh, when we remove uh, all of the clamping, you, you can see that it mirrors the uh, warp of the panel almost exactly. So at that point, we take those pieces and there's a series of holes that we have to uh, drill for the mechanisms that will connect this structure to the panel. And here we are putting the strainer together. And then this is our this is the, the a cross section of the little mechanisms that we invented for this process. And the way they work is they allow movement of flexing, convex flexing, or lateral movement. It can move in any direction, um, and, it, and it, 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 it won't bind in the same way the cradles did. So this is our updated version for dealing with the, that uh, wood movement. And here's all the pieces we have a nylon a nylon flexible screw that fits into the wooden block that is spot glued onto the panel. And then we have a laser cut disc spring and a little collet that fits in the center and then a brass nut that we can tighten down and that can, uh, you can adjust the, the uh, tension to, to whatever level uh, is desired. So here are the pieces uh, ready to be glued in place. And here we are putting them onto the surface. And those, those can, be, can be removed uh, very, very easily by either paring them away or you can pop them off quite easily with, uh, with a chisel without uh, damaging the surface. And so here we are putting the uh, strainer in place. And this is uh, putting on the, the, the nut that, that adjusts the tension. And here they are finished. And so now at the end, the overall curvature, you can, you can see that there's a much more uniform curvature compared to what uh, was there before. And then we can turn it over uh, to Ulrich. So we start with the, the cradles and then after repair of all those, uh, all those splits and then adding the, the, uh, the new support strainer and then they went back to uh, back to Ulrich. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, George. And if this looked scary to you um, on these slides, um, you can imagine what it um, was for me. 
you know, witnessing this, this process. Um, so for some of the pictures, I was actually behind the camera with uh, bated breath, <laughs> <laughs> watching them take the panel apart and, um, and uh, routing all these channels <laughs> into the panel. But um, it's been an incredible um, process, and it is something um, that should be mentioned was developed um, over almost 30 years or more than 30 years. You of mean the spring mechanisms? Yeah, like yeah, uh, yes, they you started working together. Uh, oh yeah, Jose, Jose and I, uh, since 1990, we've been, we've been uh, working together. I've done many projects together with him at the Prado or at the Metropolitan. We did in London and at the Courtauld and Kunsthistorisches in Vienna and various, Krakow, uh, various other places, so. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. And um, now maybe on to the next segment um, of this um, panel discussion. And so we had some questions, some burning questions actually, that um, concerned the material side um, of, of the, the conservation treatment. And so um, Douglas McLennan, um, who works at GCI, um, the Getty Conservation Institute here, um, was closely collaborating with us um, on the um, some of the um, analytical um, processes that um, elucidated some of these um, some of these technical details that you're going to hear much more about now. Thank you, Ulrich. Thank you, George. Uh, we're just testing how it works. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you for the introduction, and um, I would just like to start by also thanking everyone here on this team, Cronach, as well as um, everyone from my group who's sort of not on stage, at least in, in, in body. Uh, of course, all this work can't be done alone, so I want to thank everyone in technical studies and also GCI science and the people that have really contributed to these results specifically that um, I will only talk about a small portion because we don't have that much time together. So this is the Getty Center. Um, of course, everyone knows, but what maybe some of you don't know is that there's actually a number of different programs here. The museum, of course, the foundation, the research institute, and I belong here in this group, Conservation Institute, East Building, um, and the part of the Conservation Institute that I work in is called Science, and if we come down one more level, um, the research group that I'm in is called Technical Studies Research, and that hopefully describes our remit pretty well, technical studies. Uh, typically, we work to support the various conservation projects that take place in the museum. So this could be an object that belongs to the Getty, or like today, we're talking about a Norton Simon picture. And um, the work that we do kind of in a nutshell could be called the science of art. That's kind of a equip, and that sort of has a couple different things. So we look at the environmental response of artworks. So how do paintings or sculptures respond to changes in humidity or temperature? We look at what we've been talking about a lot today of different materials that artists use to create these objects or the techniques that they use to apply the materials. Um, we study how these materials degrade or age over time. And we also kind of look at newer things, like what kinds of materials would help conservation today? Um, how do conservators work with the best, most stable types of materials so that hopefully these chronics don't need treatment for another 100 years or maybe more? Um, and a lot of the times, a technical study starts with pretty simple questions analytically. With paintings, it's often about cleaning. Can you help identify what this varnish layer is because it's not coming off the way that I thought. But um, inevitably the questions get much more complicated and I think I'll jump right into sort of that midstream in medias res here with Cronach. Um, you can see Eve with, um, as our patient zero on the yellow table getting ready for scanning. And as Ulrich had just already mentioned, the, the questions quickly evolved to rather, rather complicated ones regarding what were the materials that Cronach used to paint these? How have these materials maybe changed over time? And in order to do that, we really need to take a close look. So one of the most powerful, relatively new techniques that we have here at the GCI is called scanning X-ray fluorescence, XRF, I might be using that again, 
um, spectroscopy. And you can see the instrument in this image here. Um, it comprises of a spectrometer, so we shoot x-rays at the painting, and it's, the spectrometer is mounted to this large gantry. And the gantry just allows the spectrometer head to move like a, like a scan. And to use a sort of LA-friendly analogy, uh, because I don't have a video, unfortunately, <laughs> um, imagine yourself driving in very slow traffic on the 405, and on your car you have an X-ray gun that shoots out to one side, and, and then a detector. And you're shooting out X-rays and you're measuring the elemental composition of what's next to you, and then you're detecting it back. After an hour, so you've probably gone like a quarter mile, you'll have a pretty high resolution <laughs> elemental map of like your surrounding. And that's basically the same thing we've done with Eve and Adam. Uh, so we take many, many individual measurements. Our measurements are only 500 microns. And um, then we sum them all together and we can get maps. So um, I think Eve was like three or four million spectra. So what did the data look like? Okay. Here's Eve's head, invisible light, mid-treatment. We can isolate the actual elements that we want to map. So this is a distribution of lead, or I should say one of the, one of the lead lines. And lead here, um, like all these maps that you'll see, where a pixel is bright, it means that there's a lot of that. So in this case, Eve's face has a lot of lead, but around her face it's dark, so there's not a lot of lead or maybe even none. And Lead probably corresponds to these two things in the 1530s. Uh, actually, I did confirm this. So both lead white and lead tin yellow. We can also look at other elements like calcium. This one I wanted to put on because uh, it relates to a material that George has already alluded to, which is at the lowest layers of the, of the, of the painting, uh, which is a ground. It's a priming layer. And you can see that it's really visible around Eve's head but it's not really visible under her head. And this is a bit of a, a trick because it is there, but it's being shielded by all this lead in her face. So just a little thing. Um, chalk grounds, here's, an, here's a different one of iron. Unlike these other ones, this probably relates to a whole bunch of different things. So I'm just gonna call those iron earth pigments. Um, these maps all really weren't a big surprise. We see this a lot in these old master pictures. Um, but they do help us understand the different materials that comprise Cronach's palette. This, though, is an example of something that was like, we totally didn't expect it. So this is a map of zinc, and actually you'll see that some of it's white, some of it's red, and the red I'm gonna digitally remove because it's all modern retouching, but this is the original zinc map. I hope it's really clear that it's like an outline around Eve's body. Um, it's not totally contiguous in some areas, it's a little bit thick. In others, it's almost just a, just a line. But um, we actually had other maps with the same distribution. Manganese, iron, potassium. And we were like, what is this stuff? Um, we don't really see zinc in particular in 16th century um, paintings. It's typically something that's used much later. Zinc white, for example, in the late 19th century or maybe your mineral sunscreens today. Um, <laughs> but like I mentioned at the beginning, we really rely on the work of our colleagues. And in 2015, uh, colleagues out of the London National Gallery published um, a catalog of German paintings. And Susan Foister and um, Rika Spring looked at this portrait, also by Cronach, from just a few years before Adam and Eve, and they describe using FTIR spectroscopy in, in a sample removed from this black background, they don't say where, this material called white vitriol, which contained zinc sulfate, as well as potassium and iron by elemental analysis. So this was a real clue. Could our picture have something similar? Um, I want to take you on a little bit of a vitriol journey because it's kind of an interesting material, so please allow me to um, digress just this little bit because I hope it kind of brings, brings it all together. Vitriol um, had a lot of names. Two other names were Copperus, Galitzenstein. The word to me sounds like you're angry, but actually it comes from the Latin vitreus, which means glassy. And that's just a remark of how it appeared to the, to the eye. Um, it was a material which this guy, Agricola, who was a contemporary of Cronach, living in the same region in, in Saxony, 
um, was really interested in. He wrote an important treatise on geology um, called De Re Metallica, which was published in 1556, just posthumously by one year. And it was translated actually into German very early. The German name is pretty awesome. It's called the Berg Berg Buch up here. Um, and Agricola describes the manufacture of white vitriol in his time. And these are two illustrations from his book um, where you can see a man removing some material from a mine and this pretty big kind of pool outside. And the, the vitriol was in the earth. It was mined and it was fermented. That's Agricola's word. Fermented in vats under the sun for, for weeks or, or more. At some point, it did something. And then they brought it inside and they put it into these large vats, like you see here, with the purpose of basically purifying the material. So when you're done, you get like these kind of crystalline rock candy shapes. And vitriol was used for a whole number of things, but in art, it's primarily used as a drying agent. The $10 word is sicative, or as a component of gall inks. It's also used in Kronach's time as medicine, but I can't imagine for what. Um, here's an image of, of, of um, the, the primary compound in white vitriol, which is zinc sulfate. And you can see, hopefully, that it indeed looks like rock candy. It should, it's pretty glassy. And it was added to oil and then boiled for some, for some time. And what this process did was basically pre-polymerize the oil or kind of condition it or catalyze it for, for drying rapidly. So any painters in the room will know that oil paint takes a really long time to dry. Um, anything you can do to speed that up might be beneficial. So let's go back to Lucas Cronach. Um, in 1520, the elector made him basically like the pharmacist for Wittenberg. Um, this is the, the deed that sort of gives him this, this ability. And in fact, if you go to Wittenberg today, you'll see that the Cronach Apotheca is still in business, but I doubt it's from the same family. <laughs> um, and this actually is the building of, of Cronach's, is it his first studio, his second studio? Second, yeah. second studio. Yeah. Uh, just mere footsteps from the Cronach House, also in the marketplace. Um, so another connection to Cronach is that, I mentioned it comes out of a mine, and Agricola describes this particular mine, Rommelsberg in Goslar, as being one of the most important sites for white vitriol production in his time. And indeed, this mine is just about 100 miles away from Wittenberg proper. So all this to say that... Um, the artist had a lot of connection to the material and um, also actually had it in his pharmacy. Um, and I'm going to get to why that's important in just a minute, but just wanted to zoom out and be like, it's not just Cronach. Um, other painters are using white vitriol in their paintings, like Van Eyck in um, London found it in this very famous double portrait. Uh, it's being used in the Rhine Valley. Here's a picture of a panel by Stefan Lochner from 1450. Um, also is a sicative in the oil. And here from Hans Holbein the Elder, uh, vitriol was identified uh, in the, the very lowest layers in the inks, so as a preparatory material in the gall inks. So this kind of a, a survey of its different uses. But in Cronach's Eve, we see it instead limited to just this outline. So this is the same map that you saw just a few minutes ago. And if we look at specific areas with close examination, um, we start to understand that Cronach used vitriol probably in, in multiple ways, but I think the one that's most clear in this image is its use as a sicative in the black paint. And not just the black paint, but the very last layers of black paint. So what we see here, let me switch to the pointer, is a rather thick band of zinc enrichment which has a pretty sharp line on the skin side, but then kind of diffuses out into the background. Let um, me advance this here. So something along the lines of this. And what Cronach is doing is really sort of searching for that final outline of Eve's body to delineate it from this black surface, and then painting in the hair. I'll advance to another example down at her feet, which I think hopefully will really convince you. Um, the zinc here is really prominent between her legs and on both sides of her arm, about this. 
And what we see is that it doesn't extend into the ground. It's just the black. And what we think is that he's using this material as a way to sort of search for the final contours of Eve's body in the areas maybe that were either changing. Um, John mentioned the word pentiment earlier this afternoon. And in fact, both of these areas contain flesh paint that's now been painted over black. And he's using instead this sort of quick drying black paint to come in at the last minute and then create the final surface of these beautiful figures. Okay, I'm gonna jump to something totally different, which is, um, I think, really cool. And this is this fibrous material. So you saw x-rays earlier today, and what we didn't talk about were these unusual fibrous materials that were present in the x-rays. And um, Ulrich had identified these quite early on in the stage, and this became a real point of, what are these? They have this sort of hairy appearance, kind of disgusting, to be honest. But hopefully you can see them as dark, hairy things here. Um, through a little bit of look that other people have done, we know that Cronach used similar types of fibrous material throughout his entire career. So this crucifixion from 1500 in his Vienna period contains similar fibrous material, but applied just along the board joints in pretty narrow bands, just a few centimeters. Um, this picture here, Christ as a Man of Sorrows, instead shows a rather different buildup where um, we have fibers in a wide band as sort of a crossbar, and then also along board joints. So what do we see in Eve? Well, the picture of Eve is something like this. We have four uh, pretty wide bands of fibrous material as sort of crossbars. And then we have fibers which are really between the entire lengths of the sixth and seventh board, the third and fourth, and part of this first and second board, um, but not the entire thing. So it's a bit of an intermediate. And it seems that the consensus about at least the function of these fibers was that they reinforce the panels. And I think at some level, it speaks to the carpenter's knowledge of how the wood would react. And so they're giving special attention, say, to certain areas. Um, Ulrich and I took a sample then from one of these areas, just a very tiny one, in order to directly see what these fibers are. And that's the star here. And it revealed the stratigraphy in this area, which is panel, so the wood and cross-section, all these fibers, and then building up a chalk ground until you get a really smooth surface. Um, he and Karen, my supervisor, did some microscopy, and this is one of these shots that they got. And you can see, I hope, long bundles of fiber, and then at a much more finer scale, this sort of horizontal banding. And that banding is important because it suggests that these fibers are coming from some sort of animal. They're protein and not, say, like a hemp or flax or some sort of plant fiber. So this was an interesting result. And we gave the sample to my colleague, Joy. Joy does a lot of chromatography, which is a great technique for identifying things in a bit more specificity. She'll take a small sample of this break it into its many constituent parts, and then when things hit the detector, she's able to say kind of what they are with more specificity than just microscopy. And what Joy found is that they're collagen. So I think about collagen like this, like it's in your skin. And indeed, collagen is a um, sort of a, a polymer that's found in mammals and fish. Um, so we're taking this a little bit further, and I, Joy has a colleague who works in Massachusetts who does a really, um, well, it, it's quite a, a, a technique. It's called matrix-assisted laser desorption, ionization, time of flight, mass spec, <laughs> peptide mass fingerprint. Um, or you can call it Maldi-Tough PMF. And, um, <laughs> Not easier. <laughs> with a name like this, it better show good results, right? So this is the scientist. His name is Dan Kirby. Um, and he, did, he, he took a sample that, that Joy prepared. And his results were pretty interesting. So he found that the fibers were primarily goat and also cow. And so we're currently trying to figure out whether it's maybe a mixture of two animals or maybe there's a chance that the ground, so the chalk might be bound in the, in the glue of one of these animals while the fibers are the other. This is sort of work that needs to be done. Um, but 
uh, stay tuned for that. And so all this to say, you know, we can really chase these trees or chase these, these questions, these research questions, but like, I just wanted to remind as I pass the torch back to Ulrich to contextualize that, you know, the scientific analysis of paintings or, or works on art, they really do offer kind of material evidence for things that are really outside the scope of like traditional art historical questions. And so in these cases, we come up with interesting results that really requires all of this team to contextualize and say why it's important. But for the case of these glues, this is a great example of like something that is very fresh and is now um, bringing on new research questions that people like didn't have even 25 years ago to make new connections about Cronach's work. Um, so really stay tuned. Thank you. I'm going to pass this to Ulrich. Oh, I, I would just like to also say regarding that, that uh, when Jose and I uh, worked on the Durer Adam and Eve uh, at the Prado, um, these fibers are, are present there also in the same kind of bands. But interestingly enough, the, the Eve still retained the original surface on the reverse, whereas the Adam was thinned and cradled. And what we saw is that those fibers exist on the front and also on the back. Mm. And, and that you couldn't see from the Cronachs because it's, it's lost that surface. But, uh, but it's clear that it was on both sides. And it, it seemed that, the, you know, that, the, that the, the purpose of it was for dimensional stability. It's, uh, you know, it's trying to uh, prevent warping and, uh, and, and prevent the joints from opening and so on. But, that it was a common practice. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So that was fascinating. And um, it was really surprising um, for us to, to, make, um, to find um, this fibrous material um, to consist of, um, as we found out, um, tendons, actually. Um, so tendons um, were used for um, bow making, um, for um, instruments, and um, all kinds of... Um, Everything of, of, of the animal was, was used, nothing was wasted, and so um, they made glue from, um, from the skin from animals, um, but you could also make glue from um, sinew or tendons, um, as it was the case for these panels. And it's actually something um, that, was, um, that was successfully identified a um, few years ago um, by a team of um, German conservators and scientists and um, is well documented. Um, they looked at various uh, medieval shields, um, but also um, a couple of um, panel paintings by uh, Lukas Kranach and found exactly um, this fibrous material um, on top of the panels to reinforce um, the joints um, in the, um, the individual planks. And so um, while we expected to find um, this fibrous material to consist of, as you mentioned, flax or hemp, or sometimes horsehair um, was used also. Um, we we're surprised um, to, to be able to analyze it um, consisting of, of, of tendons. And so, um, again, you can see in, in the x-ray, um, you can see all this fibrous material um, going perpendicular to um, the direction of the individual planks, um, reinforcing it. And here um, I um, made a little mock-up uh, of a panel in, in the Penny Conservation Studio, um, actually using actual sinew, actual tendons, so in this case they're um, deer tendons, um, that I made glue from. And then um, once they were um, cooked, basically, and you had the glue, um, you would take the fibers out of the glue bath and lay them over the, um, the panel. Um, here you see them. Um, you see all the, the fibrous material um, that you have to pull apart to get these very fine strands. And then here you see them um, go across um, the panel surface, and then um, um, lower down you see um, the gesso application 
which covers um, these, these fibers. So um, there were some very important question, um, questions that we had um, that very much informed sort of our treatment approach. And so um, it was really crucial to have um, this material analysis um, conducted by GCI. And, um, and um, so we've been working um, with Douglas over you know, a period of two years um, to tickle out all the, um, all the um, details about the materials that, you, that um, Kronach used in the, in the painting. And it enabled us to um, reconstruct how they were um, painted in the first place. So um, not only um, did we find out much more about the construction of the panels, but also about the sequence um, of the paint application, um, which is somewhat unusual. So you see in, in these paintings and, and others um, by Kranach, this silhouette effect with its um, very almost black, inky black ground, um, that sort of very almost harsh outlines delineates um, the figures of, of Adam and Eve. And this is achieved by um, Kranach first um, um, on top of the ground, the relatively white ground, um, do some um, very cursory underdrawing, um, some of those um, underdrawing lines that you've, um, that you could see actually in the area of the fig leaves um, that John talked about earlier. And um, he would then follow um, with the application of paint uh, of the flesh tones. And so um, um, relatively um, spare mixture of, um, of pigments was used um, for the flesh tones. Um, he would block in um, the figures and then um, later um, actually paint with a um, black background around, around the figures and, and further um, sort of um, delineating um, these figures. So, so the black background is actually on top of the, um, of the flesh tones. And then um, the other details are um, on top of that. So the hair, um, the tree, and all of the other details that you see in the, in the painting are, um, are added last. So um, it was you know, an incredible experience actually to see, um, be able to learn more about how these paintings were conceived um, in addition to getting really, really important clues um, about the, um, the material side of, of, of these paintings, which in turn helped me um, with the conservation treatment and, and the reconstruction. So um, this shows <laughs> the paintings <Credit> to <laughs> installed <Richard> at the <laughs> Getty as you see them now. And, um, and I would invite you to, um, to go up to the galleries um, where they are on display now for the, um, for the next couple of months until um, April, April 21st. 21st. Yeah. Well, I hardly know how to conclude and wrap this all up because it's been so incredible. And even for John and me, you know, we've been hearing some of these stories and able to witness the treatments along the way, but I'm still learning more as I hear you talk about it. And I'm sure we'll continue to digest what you're sharing with us today and the months to come. I just wanted to mention very briefly, um, we get a lot of questions about the frame. And so now that we've moved on to displaying these works in the galleries again, I wanted to show you the before and after. This was the one final change that took place with the paintings. Because of the change in the curvature of the panels, reframing them was a necessity, but it was also a, a real benefit aesthetically because these paintings had been framed in 1976 in a sort of 17th century Dutch style that was very fashionable in the 20th century, but we're moving on to the 21st century now and going back to 16th century Germany. 
Um, and my colleague, Gloria Williams Sander, commissioned these beautiful frames, um, which replicate a much more historically authentic style. And we were really taken with the ways that the gilded arabesques sort of pick up the coils of Eve's hair and the sort of twisting body of the serpent and encourage you to sort of move your eye through the composition. I think John is gonna share just some final concluding remarks and then we'll take questions. Well, I, I think now you see what I was getting at earlier about how this really was a, a dream team. Uh, the idea of working uh, with such a, a, a group of, of absolute specialists in their field, um, there's sort of a synergy there that we've really benefited from. The, this, this team approach really um, catalyzed so many discussions, but what it really allowed us to do was to really, really hit that sweet spot between balancing what our collective uh, professional mandate, our, our ethical principles dictate in the field of art conservation for minimal intervention, preserving as much of the original historic fabric as absolutely possible um, for so many reasons, but not the least of which is for the unsuspecting clues that might still come down through the centuries in, in places you would never quite imagine on the object as a three-dimensional object. Just the, the information that we've gotten is just so incredible thanks to hunches and insights and observations and shared discussions. And yes, it took a couple of years for this, but I think that just helps this process just immensely. So when these panels come home to the Norton Simon Museum, not only are we gonna have really some transformed artworks that have their uh, structural integrity reestablished, um, but also the surfaces now are so much closer to Cronach's original intent. Um, literally more of his actual paint is exposed as you saw with the, the revealing of more areas that had been overpainted. Um, incredibly sensitive uh, retouching by Ulrich, visually reintegrated the damages that you see. Um, that sweet spot that I'm talking about of balancing the, uh, uh, our ethical concerns um, is that balance between doing just that and incredibly uh, uh, confident, important surgical interventions in exactly the right way to, uh, again, George used the phrase, don't try this at home. And we all just sort of gasped, I know, with seeing some of these, these images of just how close um, they were coming to the, the very surface. But the, the surgical precision was just astounding. And that's not necessarily something that's applicable to the whole range of cultural heritage materials, but in the, this, this very specific case of these important paintings in the body of work of Lucas Cronach the Elder, um, I think we hit exactly that sweet spot. The other amazing thing that comes out of this process that we're getting back at the museum is just absolutely exquisite documentation. And that documentation not only records all the observations that were made, the discoveries about working methods, but the conditions and, and really connecting the dots between sort of cause and effect, but uh, of condition and past interventions. Just really, really understanding and assessing uh, what was done by the imposition of these cradles on the back. Um, that's incredibly important. But even more important is documenting our rationale, our thinking, the reason behind all the different interventions, the choices that were made. Um, and what that's going to do is allow future generations of conservators, art historians, conservation scientists, the ability to make a really accurate assessment of the success and maybe the shortcomings of these interventions that were made, 
um, but it's going to give them an even more solid foundation for making additional choices in the future so these panels can survive into future centuries. So for all of that, um, I know I speak for everybody on staff at the Norton Simon um, that we're so grateful to this team and what, um, what you've all done for us. So thank you so much. We, we are equally grateful, actually, that you entrusted us with these incredible works. And, um, and it's sort of comforting for, for me to know that we just carry these, these paintings, um, the Kranas, um, through our generation. And um, they've been around for almost 500 years. And, um, and now, thanks to um, the structural work that um, you, George, and, and Jose, performed, um, there's no reason they shouldn't survive for another 500 years. So, um, you know, kudos, kudos mm -hmm. to you and, um, and thank you all for, um, for elucidating these processes today. Really happy to hear you keep upping that number of, that we're, we're, <laughs> we're taking as an absolute guarantee. So if anything goes wrong, we can come back. Right? Well, I would love to see them. I haven't even seen them in the galleries yet. So. <laughs> I hope we have a chance. Well, um, our hope is that after we're finished here, we will head to the galleries for some um, a chance to look at the paintings together. Um, perhaps before we do that, we can take one or two questions from yeah. the audience here, uh, if there are any questions. And if you would just uh, keep your hand up, and then the microphones will come to you. I'll let you find someone, Emily. <laughs> OK, just talk. Um, I had a two-part question. One was about the restoration, and one was about the artist's original intent. And we were noticing in the before and the after pictures that the almost everything got lighter once the darkened varnish was taken off, except uh, the exception is uh, especially Eve's hair got darker, not lighter. And I was wondering, since you just said that they put the hair on, on top of the black last, if perhaps some of the pigment came off to make it a little darker rather than lighter when the varnish came off. And that was the first part of the question. And the other thing is, to the artist's original intent, we noticed that after the varnish had come off, Adam was much more red-toned and Eve was much more lighter-toned. And I wonder if uh, you could speak to whether the artist's intent was, well, Adam was first, he was there, he was tending the garden, he got more like a tan or whatever, and then she was more fair. <laughs> she was the fairer sex, and so she's whiter. I just wondered if you had any insights on those two areas. Thank you. Let me maybe um, take the first part of the question. So, um, any differences in um, how Eve's hair appears um, in the two different slides is uh, merely based on um, photographic um, differences. <laughs> so, um, they're exactly um, the same um, post cleaning and, um, yeah. and in painting. Uh, well, since I got the fig leaf, I'll deal with it. <laughs> the tan. Um, <laughs> so it's a great observation that you make, and actually one of the big um, changes for us too, which was really thrilling to see, which was in fact the way that Chronic differentiates uh, the skin of Adam, who I think you know in some ways it's a it's also a Renaissance expectation where male coloring was more, as you say, ruddy, vigorous, outdoor looking, um, and then Eve. Um, her skin tone probably reflects some of the ideals at the time. Um, this kind of luminous kind of, um, one of our guests referred to it as pearly, which is a great description, mm -hmm. kind of iridescent um, color. So that uh, juxtaposition is very intentional. It helps identify each of those figures. So, I think we can do one more question. I have a microphone here. Uh, my, my question is a bit more personal, um, or personal for you, the people that worked on it. It's amazing that they've lasted this long already. And you're the people that get to touch them. We all can't touch them. And, and it's amazing when you're right there and you're working on these panels and you've done a great job of showing us all what that's like. When we do the ooh and ahs of how scary it can be, are there moments when you're standing there and you're actually touching and working with them that you are amazed by the resilience? Because I'm thinking about the hardness of the paint now and the materials that you guys are all talking about. and is there a moment when you're like, wow, they really knew what they were doing, even though you have worms and you have all these elements that are really causing damage and you know, decomposition? Because 
it's amazing that they still exist in, in, in a way, you know. And were they thinking like Gothic architects that this church is not going to be done for a thousand years and I'm going to be gone? That mindset must have been in these painters' lives as well. And when, what, just from a personal experience, when have you experienced that moment where you're like, wow, you know, you, you also are impressed by it because it can get normal to work with something for such a long period of time and it doesn't seem as delicate. Yeah. No, you're, you're exactly right. And I couldn't have put it better <laughs> myself. Um, you are and you have to be in awe um, of, um, you know, what you have in front of you. And, and we had to, the privilege to work with f over this, um, you know, relatively long period of two and a half years. Um, you get to know these, um, these works so intimately and um, um, you really um, build a connection with, with them. And, but you're right, um, you're very much in awe of the fact that um, these materials and were put together so masterfully. And um, it's, it's also important to, to remember that you know, these paintings as we see them um, today in the gallery, there's so much more than um, just the sum of the, of the individual materials that were used to put them together. And um, you're always aware of that um, when you work with them and, and when you handle the, these works. So um, it's, just a, it's just an incredible privilege. Uh, you know, I, I would like to add that, um, you know, in, 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 in our day and age, the, the ease with which we can shoot images and, 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 and take pictures, you know, since the, in, uh, the inception of photography. But these were the image makers. They were the only, they, they were the, if you wanted an image of something, you had to make it. And so the whole process of training and learning about the materials and, and, and over long apprenticeships to make those things, like you say, to make the, the materials stick and to make them last and to, make, to, to build them responsibly so that they last over time, that, that kind of thing, uh, it's amazing how prevalent that was, uh, you know, how... Uh, how stable these things really were. Do you set up any um, charts for yourself for the future to maybe go back and measure every couple of years and see if there's any changes or slight movements by a millimeter to make adjustments? Well, you, you can uh, periodically um, uh, check on the, uh, on the spring mechanisms and, 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 and see the tension there, how much they've uh, uh, adapted to that. And uh, yes, I mean, sometimes you're introducing a, a, a calculated amount of stress, but it's, again, it's against a surface, so it's not, uh, it's not dangerous in that sense. But you would see that over time, sometimes the, 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 the tensions that you build into it can dissipate over time so that it relaxes into a new configuration slightly. Uh, but you're talking about fractions of millimeters there, you know. Well, I, um, if I may, thank you all yeah. <laughs> for participating in this panel and invite us to continue to talk about, um, there are many, many fascinating aspects that are worth discussing a little bit more. So for those of you who um, are able, please join us in the gallery. Um, we're going to the North Pavilion, the second floor. There are two galleries with red walls. You'll find us um, in the one uh, N204. Um, and we'll be there for about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, uh, hopefully. Um, and can hear more from you. Um, so, so that's the second floor of the North. Second floor, North Pavilion of, of the, the museum. North Pavilion, yeah. yeah. Red walls. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you all.